Uh, hi, I'm Rebecca Murphy. I am a JavaScript developer at Boku. I never know which of these slides to put first, like that one or that one. Uh, I'm a JavaScript developer at Boku, and today I want to talk about how, you know, this is a jQuery conference. We're all here because we like jQuery and because we um, are probably either using it or planning to use it uh, in, our, in our jobs. Um, and what I want to talk about today is how do we can think about how to do our jobs and how to make especially applications on the client side uh, using some patterns that, that kind of go beyond the traditional get some elements and do something with them approach of jQuery. Um, so before I get started, like I said, I'm a senior JavaScript developer at Boku. Um, that's me, that's my Twitter, that's our website. And uh, I'm also the author of the much outdated but still sort of useful uh, jQuery fundamentals, jqfundamentals.com, which if you have been working on learning jQuery, you've probably um, passed by that once or twice. Um, and these days, I spend a lot of my time talking about and thinking about and helping clients with client-side application organization. <coughs> so helping them um, and talking about how, like I said, you can go beyond the traditional DOM-centric approaches that we've, that we've kind of learned and start to create code that is well-organized, maintainable, pleasant to develop with, testable, uh, and decouples our JavaScript from the HTML on our page. Maybe even uses JavaScript to create the HTML on the page. You know, maybe our <coughs> HTML is not coming from our server anymore. Maybe, uh, maybe instead we're actually creating the HTML just from the data that's coming from the server. So this is kind of what we're seeing happening um, with JavaScript these days is more and more of this client side, of the logic of our applications is moving to the client side. So before we talk about that, though, um, I want to talk about kind of where we've come from, which is this. Uh, this is how many people were writing JavaScript before jQuery came along? All right, about 30% of you maybe lived in that terrible, terrible time. Uh, and this is what we <laughs> wrote then. Um, is it IE? Is it IE for Mac? Remember IE for Mac? That was a thing. Um, <coughs> Netscape 4, good times. Uh, so this is what JavaScript used to look like, and this is what these are the kinds of problems that, as front-end developers, we used to spend our time on, were these agonizing browser differences. And then, of course, in 2006, jQuery came along, and it wasn't the first library to give us some tools that kind of smoothed over those browser differences but we can fairly, all 600 of us who have paid money to be in this room to hear about jQuery, we can pretty fairly say that jQuery won. Um, jQuery, jQuery has established itself as the go-to library for DOM manipulation, AJAX events and effects. Um, and it lets us mostly ignore browser differences. Uh, you know, it, God bless them for still uh, fixing our IE6 problems and IE7 and IE8. Um, it lets us mostly ignore browser differences and focus on writing code that does what we need it to do. Um, so the sweet spot of jQuery, if you go to the home page, you'll see this, uh, this little box, and this is, this is what seduces everyone, because it's like, that's like English, I can write that. Um, so the, the, the sweet spot of jQuery is to get some elements and do something with them. That's kind of the story of jQuery, and that's, that's kind of the principle that you learn with jQuery, and that's pretty cool because it means that you can take some markup that might look like this, so just like a little search form, or whatever, and you can write some JavaScript that looks like this, just, and this uses um, the new deferreds functionality, so that's pretty cool. Um, so you can take, th take that HTML and take some, write some JavaScript that looks like this, you know, just like 15 lines of JavaScript, and from that you end up with a working application, like boom, done, it's pretty, pretty great. But the problem with that 15-line approach, and I'm not saying that 15-line approach is, is wrong, it's just that it is, it may be, you may discover that it is short-sighted. Uh, because when this simple app where you search for cats and it shows you some tweets about cats, turns into this app 
where you search for cats and you need to keep track of your recent searches and you need to show videos and images and stuff from Twitter. And then maybe later there's a feature request to be able to like, like a result or something like that. So when that simple search app evolves into this, then it's really easy to end up with code that looks a whole lot like this. Who's seen code that looks like this? Every single one of you. Who's written code that looks like this? It's OK. Um, I got paid money to delete that code. It was a lot of money. Um, and it's, yeah. <coughs> um, the end. Bye. No. Uh, so the problem with that approach uh, is that it's, it's very much a black box. So your view, uh, you know, the, the user interface, uh, you can see we're making some HTML here um, and sticking it in the page in our JavaScript. The user interface, the interaction with the server to go out and get the data, um, and the, the management of state, all of that is kind of a black box. And so if something goes wrong, or if you want to reuse any portion of this code, or God help you if you want to test any portion of this code, then really all you can do is test that the end result happened. It's very difficult to test any individual steps along the way. And it's difficult to, it's difficult to, like I said, derive any benefit from this code elsewhere in your, in your application, especially as your application grows. And so you'll very quickly end up with, with, with something that looks like that code I just showed. So the story is really that get some elements and do something with them takes us so far. And it's really, really tempting to keep using that get some elements and do something with them strategy because we've grown so accustomed to it and it's so warm and fuzzy to us. It's really tempting to continue to use that strategy as the needs of our, of our applications get more and more complex. And the reality is that as your application gets more and more complex, you need to start rethinking kind of the fundamental way that you think about your application. So in this talk, I want to look at how we would build something like this slightly more complex application. Um, of course, how many people have heard of client-side MVC? All right, how many people are using some sort of client-side MVC framework? All right, a decent number of you. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, kind of just like jQuery, I need you to stay within the pool of light I have been told I need to stay within this aura. Um, sorry, video person. Um, so <coughs> here it goes. Um, so just like jQuery kind of changed everything as far as how we uh, how we dealt with uh, you know client side development back in 2006, 2007, 2008, and that was kind of the hotness, and that was kind of the skill to learn. I think what we're seeing now is that it's becoming more and more kind of expected that you know jQuery. And the new hotness, the new thing, the new, the new like thing to put on your to-do list if you have, <laughs> that was a joke. Um, not even intentionally though. Uh, the, the thing to put on your to-do list um, if you haven't yet is learning about client-side MVC. Uh, of course, you know, some people will be like, it's not really MVC, it's MVVM or MVP or MVPPV, I, I don't even know. Um, and so I like what Alex Sexton calls it, because <laughs> that pretty much covers it all. So um, the examples that I'm going to show you use Backbone. Um, of course, there are lots and lots and lots and lots of choices out there. Um, I've ordered them alphabetically so as not to expre express any favoritism, and this is just a tiny, tiny portion of the of the choices out there. And we we did a training yesterday, uh, a pre-conference jQuery training yesterday, and someone came up to me afterwards. A couple people came up to us afterwards, and they asked two interesting questions. The first question was, you know, we we are working on this application, and we think that maybe we should look beyond jQuery and maybe maybe we need to start considering one of these client side MVC frameworks and like how do we know when it's time to start considering this? And my answer to them was, you know, if you're asking this question, it's time. It's probably past time 
that you be thinking about this. Uh, so if, if, you're, if that voice is going off in the back of your head that maybe this would make life easier, it probably will. The other question that they asked, that someone else asked was, you know, how do I choose? How do I know which one of these is right for me? And I think that right now we don't know. You know, Backbone came out about 18 months ago. Um, I gave a version of this talk about 19 months ago, and Backbone hadn't, didn't exist um, the last time that I gave a talk kind of like this. And so Backbone came out, and it was kind of the answer to jQuery isn't enough, I need something more, and Backbone was kind of the answer to that. About 12 months ago, Ember came out, and Ember was sort of the answer to Backbone isn't enough, I need something more than that. And so I don't think, we don't have an answer yet. It depends a lot on what your needs are. Uh, my advice to them and my advice to you is that if you are trying to pick a framework, um, try them. Go to Todo MVC, just Google Todo MVC, and, uh, and, and look. Uh, that shows a bunch of different examples of all these different frameworks making Todo apps. Um, so go to Todo MVC and check that out and see what you see, and then make some prototypes. You know, see what it feels like to use each of them. You know, Backbone's really easy to learn. Ember is a little bit harder to learn. It's more complex, but like Yehuda was saying to me at lunch, he was like, we embrace the fact that we are more complex because we also do more for you. So I, you know, maybe in 12 to 24 months, we will, I'll be able to get up here and tell you, oh, use that one, but I, I don't think that we know yet. So before I... <coughs> Before I dig into the, the backbone code, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about you know, one of the challenges that we face when we you know, start moving our code out of a giant document ready block, for example, um, is we might, we might want to have our code in more than one file. And <coughs> for the sake of our development sanity, we might want to have our code in more than one file. But of course, we want to serve as few files as practically possible in production. Uh, and we want to be able to write modularized code that is loosely coupled, maintain that in individual files, be able to express dependencies between our files, and so be able to say this file, you know, requires these two views. You know, this page requires these two views. We need a way to express that, and require.js is a great tool for that. Uh, I just wanted to talk about it for a minute because I don't think anyone else is talking about it at this conference, um, and, and it's something I think is really valuable. Um, <coughs> so require.js lets you write um, little modules like this. So this says, I need jQuery, I need this text template HTML, and I'm going to return a function from, uh, so I'm defining a module, and my module's definition is this function that gets returned. So return a function that places that HTML in the body. Not a very exciting thing. But the cool thing about this is that we can have one script tag, both in development and in production, we can have one script tag on our page. That script tag loads require.js itself and then points to a configuration. That configuration looks like this. This configuration <coughs> sort of tells require.js everything that it needs to know about how to load all of the dependencies for your application. And require.js resolves all of these dependencies asynchronously kicks off your code, it's amazing. Um, <coughs> and so ultimately, our main JavaScript file, our app.js, looks like that. There's nothing in it except a pointer to, hey, make me a router. And, um, and we can structure our code in all these different small files that make the development experience a whole lot more pleasant. And um, tomorrow, you'll learn about Grunt from Ben Allman. Uh, Grunt is a, is a command line automation tool written in JavaScript that runs on Node that can take, um, it has tasks and these, you know, some of the tasks that it has are tasks that integrate with require.js so you can automate the production builds of all of these tiny files into one production ready file at, uh, when you're ready to go into production. So I just want to mention that, but um, let's take a look now at, um, at this actual app and how we would start to think about approaching this when we think about it in terms of an application instead of as a website. This is not my water, but we're going to pretend it is, and I'm going to drink it. Probably Adams. We hugged. It's cool. Um, so 
when we think about our application as an application and not as a just a website, then it's useful to start by thinking about the different responsibilities that our code is going to have, the different pieces of our code are, is, is going to have our gonna, mm, grammar. Um, so we have, we have the user interface piece, which is the piece that we're most accustomed to working with and the one that we think about as front-end developers all the time. We have the user interface piece, like what is it going to look like on the screen? Um, <coughs> and also, when a user interacts with this user interface, what is going to happen, you know, what events are we going to listen for on the user interface? Or are we going to be listening for clicks or focus or submits or, or those sorts of things? Uh, number two, we need to manage state. And this is something that in jQuery land, you're kind of, you have a few different options. You can use the DOM to manage state. You can use data, uh, the data method to manage state or data attributes to manage state. You can um, you know, do your own state management by just keeping um, objects around. And of course, you also need to deal with data in general. And so going to the server and, and getting data. Um, in in client side application development, we want to you know be a bit more rigorous about how we are working with data, getting data from the server. We don't want to be making raw calls to dollar ajax to go get our data. We want to have some nicer um, some nicer structures around that. We also want to make sure that that state management is separate from our user interface. And then finally, we, we need to be thinking about how we're going to broker communication between our application state and data and the user interface. So when something changes in our data, how is that change going to manifest itself in the user interface? When a user interacts with the user interface, how are we going to get that <coughs> interaction? How is that going to manifest itself in the data? So in our <coughs> little search app, or again, we're just typing in a search term. We go get some results. The results are of different types. We display the we display the different types. And we keep track of the recent searches. Um, so in our in this little app, we have three different views. We have our search form. We have our results area, and we have the recent searches. And of course, when the user clicks, uh, you know, when the user submits a search, there's two things that we need to do uh, in the user interface we need to um, update this results area. We need to update the recent searches area. And we also, of course, need to, you know, in order to make that happen, we need to go fetch the data. And so uh, Backbone is, is not as opinionated about how to do this as I wish. I, I tend to introduce the concept of a controller into Backbone, even though Backbone doesn't strictly, you know, they use routes and, eh, um, <coughs> Uh, uh, back when I, I like to have a more more strict concept of a controller, um, and so in this in this demo app, which is on GitHub, so you'll see the link later if you want to poke around in it. In this demo app, I have the idea of a controller, and the controller sets up these views. It listens for the views to announce user interaction. So these views, they don't go when you click that search form, for example, and we'll see this in a minute. When you click the submit button on that search form the search form doesn't go get the data. The search form just announces that someone has searched for something. And its job is done. And then it's up to the controller to say, oh, I care about that. And then the controller tells the, in the case of Backbone, tells the collection, hey, go get me some data for the search term. And then when that data comes back, it gets that data to the, to the right places. So uh, you know, finally, we have this. You know, I listed them in a different order uh, on the first slide because it's easier to explain that way. I've gone sort of in a different order here. Um, but finally, we have our actual state management, our, our data management. So for that, for this simple little app, we have sort of four different kinds of things that we're managing. Number one, we're managing the searches collection. It keeps track of which, what the recent searches have been. So uh, we'll, that's where we'll store, every time someone searches for something, we'll add a new search term to that. Number two, we have the search data, search results collection. I've named that terribly. We have a search results collection that actually goes and gets the search results from the server. Um, we have an app model that kind of keeps track of general application state, um, including the current search. And then we have a search model for um, that represents the individual searches. So those individual searches become entries in the searches collection. Um, <coughs> so th it's up to these pieces 
to do the actual, in, in the case of the search results collection where we need to go talk to the server, it's up to the collection to go talk to the server. The search form doesn't talk to the server. The search form just announces that something has happened and that message ultimately gets to the search collection which goes and gets the data. And when that new data comes in, it announces, hey, I have new data. And then that message gets back over to the results area. Um, so importantly, models, and in the case of backbone collections, um, may be used to manage actual data that lives on the server and that you need to go get. But they can also be used to manage more just state information or data that never really leaves the browser, but that you need in order to keep track of what's going on in your application. So they can be used for both. So if we draw a picture of kind of what our, what our app looks like when we break it down, um, like I said, our search form announces that someone has searched for something. So we click on that button and it makes an announcement that someone has searched for this term. And then the search controller hears that announcement and it says, you know, search results data, here's the new term that I need you to search for. It also says <coughs> to that list of searches, hey, someone just searched for this. And then when the, the, the search results collection goes off to the server, gets its data, and then when that comes back, it's actually the search, con the, the, um, the search results view is waiting for, waiting for the search results collection to announce it has new data. When the search results view is, hears that the search results collection has new data, then the search results view takes that data and uses it to update itself. Likewise, when the search, when the recent searches collection announces that it has a new, new data, then this recent searches view updates itself. So if we look back at our naive jQuery example, and I don't use naive in like a mean way, but just like how you would write this if you weren't thinking about client-side application organization, if we look back at our naive jQuery example, the view, it, you know, this kind of is the view and the model and the con it's everything. Um, and so it, it, this whole piece of code is responsible for fetching the data and updating itself. And, you know, this is where that gets you. We went over that before. Um, so let's zero in on this, what the code looks like for this transaction of making a search. So here's our search form. Um, well, here's a little bit of our search form view. And it's pretty simple. So we say that when the search form is submitted, then we want to run the underscore on search method of our search view. And it does some stuff to make sure that, you know, someone actually entered a term and blah, blah. Um, but once it's done verifying that, the, that this is worth announcing, then it triggers an event on itself called search. And it passes to that, uh, as an argument in that event, the term that was searched for. And so this is it. This is all that this view does. It doesn't care what happens next. And that's a key concept um, in, in when you're thinking about actually developing applications, is writing code where this is just sort of fire and forget. Uh, and it's up to the controller to decide what happens next. So our controller is waiting to hear that announcement. So it says, hey, when the search form announces a search event, then run this update function. And we won't go into what all the update function is doing um, in too much detail, but ultimately what it does is it goes out and um, it tells the, the search results collection to go get some new data, and it tells the recent searches collection that there is a new search. Um, so we get that message to the, to the model, to the collections, the search results collection, and the recent searches collection. And then when they announce that they have new data, the results area and the recent searches area are waiting for that new data to arrive. And so here, we add a new search term, for example. Um, so this is us updating our list of recent searches. Um, and so when we add a new search term to our list of recent searches, then our results view, here you can see, it's waiting to do 
this. So it is waiting for um, a add or change event to happen on that search data collection. And when it does, then it empties and um, updates itself. One of the really cool things about this approach, and I encourage you, it's hard to go through all the code for this in this, in this talk. Um, I, I don't even try. Um, so I encourage you to poke around in the code that, that's on GitHub and, and poke around in the actual demo app that's up on, up on Nojitsu. Um, but one of the things that's really cool about having these loosely coupled modules that do one thing and don't get all wrapped up in the whole process is that it's actually incredibly testable. Uh, and so I used Mocha to write some tests for this. Um, and you can also, if you download the, the code and fire up the server, you can actually see these tests running and see the tests and all that. Um, but it's, it's incredibly testable. It's incredibly easy to test. So we can, write, um, we can write a test that says, hey, can you verify that when, the, when there's a new search made, um, can we verify that the time on, so th what, what happened there is that, that um, a, if a user searches for a term that they've searched for before, then we don't make a new entry in the recent searches. We just update the timestamp on that existing search so that they'll end up being ordered properly in that recent searches area. And so we want to verify that when someone <coughs> makes a search for something that they've searched for before, and we call this update method, we want to make sure that this update method does indeed update the time. Um, and so we can check to make sure that when we call this update method, we do indeed update the time. And so we can, we can when we break our code down into these tiny little bits, um, and, and get away from these long chains and get away from these like giant callback functions attached to events. Um, when we write individual little bits of code that do one thing and do it well, we can write tests that give us a high degree of confidence that our code is actually doing what we expect it to do. So you know, likewise, we can, we can test that you know, when there's a new search, uh, that the recent searches area gets updated as it should. We can write really simple little five-line tests like, okay, I expect to not see Baz, and then I'm going to search for Baz, and then I expect to see Baz in the recent searches area. And so we can write really simple tests that verify that, that those transactions are happening as we expect them to. Um, I'm... Well, my computer says I have two minutes left. This says I have seven minutes left. I don't know which one's which. Um, so I'll spend a minute talking about this, which is um, I work for Boku. I do um, training and stuff there as well as doing consulting. And we have a couple of trainings coming up um, that you might be interested in since you're here. Um, the one I really want to talk about is one that we have coming up in September. It's not even on the website yet, but I'll tell you about it. And that's we're going to, if you're interested in this testing stuff, which I think... I think a year from now, that's, that, that's what I'll be here talking about, is testing, because I think that's kind of the next thing for us as a front-end developer community. Like, OK, we got through browser differences. We're going to figure out how to develop client-side apps. Like, I feel good about that. I feel like we're, we're on the right track to that. And then the next thing that we have to figure out is, as, our, as the things that we're building get more and more and more complex, we're going to have to figure out how to automate the quality assurance of them. We're going to need to figure out how to prove without clicking buttons all day that the code that we wrote works. And so I think that that's, that's kind of the next thing, and I'm excited about doing a training on it at Boku later in the fall. So if you're interested in that, go there, sign up for the mailing list or follow us, et cetera. Um, and that's me. So thank you very much. And uh, check out the demo at, on GitHub. And you can check it out um, on Nojitsu, too, if you want to just like search for things for fun. You know, so cool. Thank you.